Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome back to the PostgreSQL experts track here, apparently, since right after, I'm right after Josh, the CEO. Um, so we're going to talk about PostgreSQL and JSON. So what's the state of the art in 2015 with PostgreSQL and JSON? Uh, so that's me. Um, I'm a consultant with PostgreSQL experts. Um, TheBuild.com is my personal blog. To answer the most often asked question, the slides will be there once I have a chance to upload them. That's personal. Uh, my per uh, that's the business blog. Um, my Twitter account and my email address. So, so for the one or two people in the room maybe who don't actually know what JSON is, um, it's an abbreviation for JavaScript Object Notation. Um, it's a text format for serializing nested data structures. Uh, and it's based on JavaScript's declaration syntax, just the name. So, so in, you know, 2000, in 200 years, no one will remember what JavaScript is, but we'll also be using JSON probably. Um, it was originally designed because you could just drop it into the eval function in JSON and have it pop out as a, as a parse structure. Please don't do this. You know, we, we went through all this trouble to get rid of SQL injection attacks, and now we have JSON injection attacks. Oh well. Um, the um, JSON primitive types. But the original intention was that you could just drop it into eval back in the day. Um, uh, it has strings, which are always Unicode, um, which is good because character encoding was the worst idea that computing ever had. Um, de facto, JSON is always UTF-8 in flight. UTF-8 is as close to a perfect solution to the character encoding problem that we'll always have. And everybody, is now, and everybody who ex has experience with char character encoding says, but UTF-8 is horrible. And you're right, but it's the better, best solution we'll probably ever come up with. Um, numbers, which are either integers or floats. Um, Booleans, true or false, and the, the singleton value null, and that's it. That's all you get in JSON. Um, you then can build things up into arrays, and hashes or dictionaries or whatever you call them. The JSON spec calls them objects, which was like, what were they thinking? Um, they use the brace notation, like that. Except not curly braces, but that, blame that on Keynote. Um, the keys have to be strings, the values can be anything. And you, you, you build those up into more complex types. There's no type declaration mechanism in JSON. There's no way of, of validating anything except that you write code that says this works or this doesn't. Um, this is why object's kind of an unfortunate terminology because that has connotations that don't apply in this case. It's just a dictionary if you're a Python guy. Um, so, Everything is delegated to the application in terms of correctness. Um, you get this data structure, and it's up to you to decide if the, the, it makes sense to you or not. So the good part is it's super simple to generate and, and parse. You, have, you are spoiled for choice in any modern language to how many ways you can parse this thing. Um, the spec's really easy to read. It's five pages with big pictures, you know, so, which is refreshing coming from, anyone ever use ASN1? Am I the only person old enough? Okay, one, one other person is old enough to remember ASN1. JavaScript is a whole, is, seems really nice compared to that, or even XML. Um, and it's a de facto standard. Pretty much everybody uses it. Once, and, and then once in a while somebody will pop up with XML and I'll have to remember XML. You know, post format is still used, but applications that do that are wrong. So, but the bad part is, there are no higher level standards. What is the standard for a date time? In JavaScript, there isn't one. I don't know. You figure it out. You, it's a thing, you know. Um, you know, and now we have JSON injection attacks, and just don't use eval. Um, but what this talk is about is PostgreSQL has JSON. Um, it's a core type. It's not a contrib module. It's not an extension. It's not nothing. You boot up Postgres. It's there. Um, it was introduced in 9.2, and we enhanced it in 9.3, and then in 9.4 it got really very cool. And we liked it so much there are actually two JSON types in Postgres. Um, there's JSON and JSONB. I will try to always write the Postgres types in lowercase and the abstract uh, concept of JSON in uppercase in this talk. I probably will get it wrong at some point. Um, J the JSON type is a pure text representation. So it re what it really is is a wrapper around the text type in Postgres um, with validation. JSONB is a binary type. It's parsed on the way in and, and reconstructed on the way out. You can cast one to the other, of course. The JSON type stores the actual JSON text, white space and all. 
It's the way it came in blurp, directly into the database. Um, the good, you, what you get out is what you get in. Um, it's checked for correctness, but it's not otherwise processed. You can't put in syntactically invalid JSON into a JSON type, but it doesn't do anything else to it. So why would you use it? Well, you're storing the JSON and never processing it. All you need is a place to log, like, and, and this happens, you know, you're logging API requests or something like that. That's reasonable. Um, or there are two JSON features that you need to support. That order preserved object fields. This is not in the spec, it's not recommended, but there are applications that expect that, if, that you can reconstruct the exact order that, object, that key value pairs in an object came out as or more than one key of the same, uh, uh, at the same level. Um, if, you're, if your application does this, it's broken and you should fix it, but there are enough broken applications out there that we couldn't just get rid of this ability. Or for some reason, maybe compliance, or there's regulatory, or you're just feeling paranoid, you need the exact JSON that you put in, including white space, all the keys in the same, key value things in the object in the same order, you know, whatever. <clears throat> or, you're on 9.3 or earlier because it was introduced in 9.4. So if you're on 9.2 and 9.3, you're stuck. You get JSON. Otherwise, you pretty much want to use JSONB. It's parsed and encoded on the way in. Um, it's stored in a relatively compact parsed format. It's not compressed exactly in the way that we think of deflate or something like that, compressing things, but it is a more compact format because the white space is squeezed out and stuff like that. Um, there's lots more operator and function support in Postgres for JSONB than there is for JSON. And you can build indexes on it, which is really super important. Now, they're just types in Postgres. They're fully transactional. You can have multiple JSON and JSONB fields in a single table. You can, um, it uses the toast mechanism, so they can be up to one gigabyte in size, if you're feeling adventurous. Um, it can be nullable, you know. So they're just fields. There's nothing magic about them. It's just like, it, it's just like int, it's just like text. Um, JSON and JSONB both support some really basic operators. Um, there's arrow, double arrow, pound arrow, and pound double arrow. Um, this gets an element or an object as JSON. This is, this is the first mistake everybody makes when they're writing this, is that they put a single arrow in expecting to get a text field back, and instead it comes up with a JSON object, and you go, huh, what? So what you want is double arrow. And that gets an array or object field at a path and casts it to text. Both JSON and JSONB support these. But then JSONB adds a lot of stuff, like containment that goes with containment the other way. Um, one thing that can be a little surprising is containment's not a recursive operation. It doesn't search down a deeply nested structure. It only works at the top level of what you're pointing it at. It, doesn't, it, um, it, it does not apply to individual keys. It doesn't apply to nested elements. So what I mean by that is, for example, here. You're saying, does this contain that? And the answer is yes. See, there's a, 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 a colon one, there's an a colon one, yes. Does this array, one, two, three, contain one, one three? Yep, because both one and three are there. Okay, that makes sense. Um, and then, or does this a, which, which um, a, a key a, which points to an object b, which has, uh, an object which has two keys in it, b and c, does it contain this? And the answer is yes. Okay, those are, that's reasonable. So far, so good. But there's some unexpected results. For example, this doesn't, as far as for the purposes of the containment operator, this doesn't contain B7 because it isn't at the top level there. Similarly, it doesn't work on a single key. So saying contains A is false because it's looking for the exact same JSON structure. There are other operators that, that achieve these results, but containment isn't it. Then we have question mark, question mark bar, or, or bar, and question mark ampersand. So the key on the right-hand side appears on the left-hand side, or any of the keys. This one works on a single key, this one works on arrays. Pretty neat. It uses the PostgreSQL ty array type, not the JSON array type. That's an easy way to get a weird syntax error. Um, examples. <clears throat> So this one does work. Is the key A in this? Sure is. Are any of these, are, are, um, are both of these keys in there? Yep, they are. Are any of these keys in there, A or Q? 
which has A and B? Yep, they are. But is B in there? No, it's not because, again, only works at the top level. Um, <clears throat> let's cast this array to JSON B. Um, we have a JSON array here and array one, um, 100. Oh, wait, no, it only works on keys, and keys can't be integers in JSON. Hmm, okay, that's a shame. Um, and we cast this, it says, okay, well, we'll cast this to, um, we'll cast it to JSON B. Um, no, that doesn't work because it has to be a, a, a Postgres type array, not a JSON array. There are, there are functions to convert back and forth between the two of them, so you're not, too, you're not stuck, but it's surprising the first time you run into this. There are lots and lots and lots of JSON functions. We are not going to go th grind through them all because we'd be here till Saturday, but um, you can create JSON from records, you can create them from arrays, all sorts of stuff. You can expand JSON into array, uh, records, arrays, row sets, all kinds, sorts of things. Many of these have both JSON and JSONB versions, so you kind of have to check the docs sometimes to see which one they have. Um, if there's a JSON, um, and unfortunately there are some things that are pure JSON, like the creation functions, that don't have JSONB versions, which is a little weird, but there it is. So, here, just for example of two of the cooler ones, um, there's row to JSON, which accepts an arbitrary row and returns a JSON, not a JSONB object. Um, for non-string or inter-null types, basically not the core JSON types, it uses the output function of the, um, of the Postgres type, so whatever you get when you try and cast that type to a string. Um, it handles array and composite types correctly, turns those into proper JSON things. Um, so here's an example, we have a, relate, we have a table rel, um, and we say row to JSON on all the fields where the array length is two, order by ID limit three, and you know, out comes um, three rows of JSON output rather than three rows of relational output. That's pretty neat. And tags is an array field in this schema, and sure enough, we get the, we get the, the arrays the, as proper JSON arrays. So that's neat. Um, one of the things you can do with this in, um, for serious applications is you can use this as a trigger to append to an audit table regardless of schema. This is a constant problem that people run into is that you want to create an auditing system that logs every change to a, um, to a set of tables, but how do you handle the fact that they don't have the same schema? That, do you create separate audit tables for each one? Well, that's not so great because they have to write separate triggers, all that kind of stuff. So this is nice because you can unify it into a single JSON blob and just log that. Um, and that means you only have to write one trigger because you don't care about the row type that comes in. The, the function will take care of that for you. Um, another example, JSONB each text. It takes a JSON object and returns a row set, that is to, you know, a set of, as if you did a select star from a table, um, of key value pairs. And it returns each of these as a text object. You can write the world's most expensive entity attribute value query this way. Um, you wouldn't want to do it, but so, we take, the, um, we take that row to JSON, um, we take row to JSON um, inside, and then, using this rather exotic query, we turn it back into relational data, except having turned it into an individual row. Wild, I'm sure you can think of all sorts of applications for this, right? Yeah, not really. Um, seriously, um, one of the nice things though is you can expand JSONB into, um, into, uh, into things you can join on. That's the main use of it. You can write a subquery that you can use for a join. So if you have a JSON field and you want to join on one of the fields inside of it, but you don't want to extract that and keep it in a relational field, you can use this as a subquery. So that's nice. It's often more efficient to do it this way than to write, than to write extraction operators. So the, the other nice thing about JSONB is you can index it. You can index the textual JSON type which indexes it just the way it would a text type, which is basically useless. I mean, how often do you compare for the exact JSON text? You know, not very often. Um, you can do an expression index on extracted values, um, and we'll actually give some timing tests for that later, but that means in advance you're knowing which fields or elements you're going to query on. And if you do know that, it's probably better to make that data relational in Postgres anyway, because relational data is still much faster than JSON data. JSONB has GIN indexing. GIN stands for Generalized Inverted Index Indexing. The default index type 
accelerates these query, these operators. Um, again, it must be against the top level of the, uh, um, of the object. Um, you can query nested objects, but they have to be in paths that are rooted at the top level. So you start at the top level and work your way down. There, the index doesn't index. Way deep buried inside this object is there the word green. That's not, a, um, that's not something we index right now. There's a different, but there's a second kind of, of operator, which is there's an optional index, which is optional. You, can, you have to specify it when you create the index. And it only supports this. However, it's much faster on paths than the default one. So if all you're going to do is this, perhaps with nesting searches down, like this. So for example, does this, does this document contain um, at the top level a tag na named tags, a key named tags, which has an array, one of whose elements is, Q -U is key, QUI. The default will search for everything that has tags, has, key, uh, has this value, <laughs> and then do a recheck on the path structure. It works, but it's a little slow. This, th this variation, the JSON path ops variant, will go directly to that entry, so it's faster. So if you're doing this kind of query, you probably want to use this variant. So which? So if you just, you, if you just need that, that'll be faster. If you need the other supported operators, you need the bit default, which, is J it's, which has the name JSON and BOPS, but it's the default you get if you don't specify anything. But let's find out, because here we have test results, so performance testing. So this is my usual caveat when I'm doing performance testing. Um, there's an infinite universe of what you do with your database versus what I did with my test database. So always build and test using um, data that simulates your real application. I hate for people to emerge from talks like this and say, Postgres is better at blah, because it depends on what you are really doing. So don't take them as being applicable to every situation, and these are relative, not absolute results, of course. So for this test, I had a four-column schema, which is an ID, one of the primary key is a big int, first and last name, which are text, and then tags, which is an array of short text tags. Each entry had two extremely common ones, one per record, so it had either one or the other for every row, and then a diminishing number of rare tags. So we could get both the idea of how it perfor things perform when they're searching for a very common entry as opposed to a, a very rare entry. Um, I was using an i2 2x large instance. One of the reasons our AWS bill was large last month. Um, running Ubuntu 14.04. Um, these were actually done on 9.4.0. Um, I ran them before 9.4.1 came out. And I did basic tuning for the instance size, but I didn't do anything exotic as far as setting up Postgres goes. Um, 10 million records generated at random. Um, a variety of schemas. One is a pure relational schema. So each of those columns was its own column. Um, I did a hybrid one, which is I put the names in relational, but the tags is JSONB, the variable tag set is JSONB. And then JSON and JSON, and then one that's pure JSON and JSONB for the non-primary key column. Um, ran 100 iterations on each test, threw away the top and bottom 10 to make sure, get, you know, outliers or Amazon weirdness on the instance. Um, I only timed the execution time, not the time included to return results back to the client, in part because it was being written in Python, and the test harness, creating objects in Python from this, these kinds of results is relatively expensive, and that could seriously distort the results. So the first one is load 10 million records using copy. Didn't rebuild the index, um, ran it on these variations, and ta-da. So here's relational. Lower is better in this case. Um, so relational is fastest, followed by JSON, interesting, followed by the hybrid one, followed by JSONB. Hmm, okay. Um, so relational beats everything, which is no surprise there, because the, the relational data path in Postgres is very highly optimized. JSONB is slower to load than JSON because it has to process this stuff as it comes in, not just check it for syntax, but actually pass a parse it apart and turn it into a new format. So this is expected. Um, but everything's pretty much the same order of magnitude. These are apart, but they're not hugely apart. So the next one is, let's do a sequential scan for a single last name. Um, I, without an index, single last name. 
um, for the relational and hybrid, use the relational field, and use the double arrow for JSON and JSONB. I also tried the, with the containment operator for JSONB, since you can almost always rewrite one of these as one of these. Well, okay, this is why we use JSONB. Um, relational and hybrid are the same, no surprise. JSON um, with the double arrow is teeny, JSONB, excuse me, is a tiny bit, and then there's JSON, which is a huge outlier because it's having to par parse and process each of these as, as, the, as the row comes out. So, yeah, so JSON, -B, JSON to actually use is dramatically slower than JSON B. Um, and relational data is about twice as fast as JSON B. Um, these are roughly the same speed, that's in the noise, you know, that, that's with, well within the margin of error for, um, for how fast they are. Okay, B tree index lookup. So we created traditional B tree index um, directly on the last name for relational and hybrid, an expression index for JSON and JSONB. I also tried gen indexing on the JSONB field using containment. Um, hmm, all pretty much the same. Um, relational and hybrid, pretty much the same. I'm, hybrid's a tiny bit slower, probably because of the size of the, the row. Um, JSONB, interestingly enough, is a little bit faster. It's like, it's, not a lot faster, but without, but just outside the, the, the um, error on this. Um, JSON's the slowest, no surprise, and JSON gin is about the same speed. So they're all pretty much comparable. Um, JSON is actually faster than anything else, including relational in this case. Woo. Um, JSON is somewhat slower due to the extraction overhead. Um, and using an index like this is always the fastest way to look up a highly selective field, like a name, things like that. Um, using the gin index is very comparable to B-tree, and what's nice about the gin index is I didn't have to index on a particular field. I just indexed the entire JSON field, and I could, I could query on any of the contained fields in the JSON document, which is nice. And this is a big improvement over 9.3. Um, common tab, tag lookup by sequential scan. So every record had a male or female tag, 50%, 50%. Scan looking for all of one using the containment operator for the tag array, using the containment operator for JSONB. Um, and I also tried with a, a, a more traditional relational approach with a join table, um, a secondary table of tags, and we join on that. Okay, so relational, this is, this is doing a search through a relational, a traditional Postgres array field. That's the best, followed by JSONB, and the join kind of didn't pan out in this case. Um, the join table is a huge loss in this scenario because the field is very unselective. You know, I'm returning five million rows either way, um, five million rows, which means that I'm join, doing a relatively big join in the middle. Um, JSON B is slower than relational, but you know, it's in the same general range. These are not orders of magnitude apart. Um, but let's try it with a rare tag, one that, that's only, only, only 0.075% of records have this tag, so it's very selective. And I use containment, use containment for JSONB, and I also try this with the join table. Um, in both cases, I had indexed the, the join table on the tag, but in the sequential scan case, it didn't use it. Okay, join table really wins in this case because the tag's very selective. Um, JSONB is significantly slower than relational, but the relational join wins over both of them. Um, it's unsurprising because this can really very quickly isolate which rows ha um, possess this rare tag. JSONB remains slower but comparable in this, in, for this one, like we saw. Um, rare tag lookup by index. Create a gin index on, on a relational array field. Use the containment operator. Use the, use the um, containment operator for JSONB. And also try this with the join table. Hmm, okay. Relational, JSONB, relational with join. Relational is fastest in this situation, but JSONB performs comparably. And if you're storing rare tags and you, or attributes of any kind, and you don't need full JSON, consider using an array field instead of a JSON field, because the extraction will be faster in Postgres. Um, gin indexes and selectivity. Um, who are fami who's familiar with the term selectivity as, as it relates to query planning and optimization. Okay, I should explain this. 
the, the, the top level view of selectivity is how many rows am I going to get back versus how many rows am I going to have to look at? So for example, if you query a 10 million row table and you're only going to get back three rows, that's a very selective query. And generally an index will be better. If you're querying a 10 million row table and five million are coming back, that's a very unselective query and usually Postgres will do a sequential scan. So that's the, that's the easy version of what selectivity is. It's one of the most important characteristics of how Postgres decides what kind of plan to do. The problem is, as of 9.4, gin indexes on JSON-B fields have hardwired selectivity calculations. It just says, I think, I don't actually remember the number, but I think 10% are gonna come back. It doesn't c consult the actual underlying data. Um, the result is, that even if, um, it'll almost use the index, even if the selectivity is very low, even if it's going to retrieve a lot of rows, it will probably use a gin index anyway. So this, is, this can result in some very bad performance in the cases of low selectivity. So just be aware of this. The moral of the story is don't create gin indexes to do queries that are going to be highly unselective because it'll use the, it'll use the index and you'll be in bad shape. And this is an area that definitely needs some coding attention inside Postgres. Um, so just out of curiosity, okay, we, we've been sort of hand-waving and said these indexes exist, but how long did it take to create them? Um, so how long, the, creating the, the B-tree index on the last name, the, the gin index on relational array, and the, the gin ops and path ops on JSONB. Um, interestingly enough, and this is very surprising, for especially with people who have been using gin indexes for other things in Postgres. The B-tree took the longest to build. Um, the gin array index was very fast. The path ops one was very fast. And this one was, still, was slower, but still quite a bit faster than the B-tree. Um, as of 9.4, the gin build time is really fast. Um, and the, the path ops build time in particular is very fast. Um, gin indexing on arrays is also fast. So that's pretty, that's, that's a big change over 9.3 and earlier. Um, and how big is all of this stuff? The answer is roughly the same size. Um, JSONB is the largest, interestingly enough. Um, J, JSON and, and relational plus JSON are roughly the same size. Interestingly enough, the hybrid is the smallest compared to the, compared to the pure relational. Um, and the, the reason is that the original data was very, comp was, was, I didn't put a lot of gratuitous white space or anything like that in the test data. So, the, so JSONB actually had to add space to it when it was adding its internal structure. For, um, for documents that have a lot of internal white space, those numbers may very well be different. And lastly, so how big are the indexes? Primary key index, gen index, blah, blah, blah. Um, this, again, anyone familiar with, with, pre, with previous implementations of JSON of, or of, of JIN? The new JIN compaction feature makes a huge difference here. It's tiny compared to um, any other index size. Indexes on just the tags are very compact. Um, the path ops indexes are expected somewhat smaller than the JSON ops um, indexes. So, now that we all know that, what do we know? There was a lot of data just dumped on you, so let's talk about some conclusions. So here's my one slide oversimplification. This is what you should do. Everybody just go and do this. Um, for the basic set of attributes, just use relational data. If something's a common attribute, and you can define common for your own applications, but let's say 10% of the column of the rows will have it, make it a relational column. Remember, null, null is free. There's no space cost to a null column in Postgres. Um, for use either array fields or JSON B for extended attributes, things that are not common in your um, in, in your rows, and use file system storage for really big stuff because really big stuff um, in the megabyte range is not is not nearly as efficiently stored in Postgres as it is on the file system. And always use JSON B if you can. There is no there is no compelling reason unless you have one of the you're, you're in one of the the early mentioned special cases to use JSON. Okay, so obviously the gorilla in the room is, I can tell the people who are laughing who remember Blazing Saddles. Um, 
is uh, MongoDB. MongoDB recently had a very major rev. Uh, version three is out now. And I did previous tests on, nine, on two, thank you. Um, and I didn't do them on the last iteration of these slides because three was about to come out and I felt that it was unfair of me to compare the, the absolute most recent shiny version of Postgres versus a relatively old version of MongoDB. So let's compare to Mongo 301. It's new, it has a faster storage engine. Um, and this, I ran this on different data sets. Um, each data set has a million records. Each, um, they're all basically pure JSON documents. Each do one document has, um, one test was a document with four fields per JSON document. The other one had 200 fields per JSON, which I consider kind of a destruction test for JSON. Um, okay, load time. This is how long it took for, to load the data set with four fields. Um, I did it two different ways. These are all based on insert, not copy in Postgres. Copy would have mopped the floor with any of these. Um, this was inserts done in a single transaction. So begin, one million inserts commit. And I, yes, I timed the commit at the end. Be fair. Um, and it was, it was fastest, followed by Mongo. Um, which doesn't really have an exact parallel between these two cases. And this is, with a, this is with a begin insert commit for each one of those million rows, which was, unsurprisingly, a lot slower, because it's doing one million F-syncs here. Here's with two, um, and here's with the 200 field case. Everything got slower. The gap between Postgres and Mongo did close. You know, to be, let's, let, fair is fair. Um, but Postgres is still faster in the load case. So let's query for a single field, single value. So um, this is, um, on one of these, th these have generated random data, so the data is quite highly distributed on it. So um, I'll pick, I picked a single field, I think it was number three in the four, in the four case, and number 12 in the 200 case. Um, and I had a bunch of different indexing things here. In Mongo, um, there's no index and an index on that particular field. Okay, so again, this is the four field case. Each document has four fields, relatively short ones. Here's Postgres with no index, Mongo with no index. We're still faster. Pretty close though. This, this, um, this bar was way up here in, two, in Mongo 2. Um, in 200 fields, let's be fair, Mongo is actually quite a bit faster than Postgres. I think the reason, um, Mongo does a lot, of, a lot more compression of tags now in the sense that it will, it doesn't store the same tags over and over and over again in the JSON field. And I think that's one of the reasons for this. Again, this is without an index. So this is sequentially scanning all one million records. In this one, I create a functional index on that column I'm searching and a field index on, that, on the field I'm searching in, um, um, in Mongo. And in this case, they both run really fast. I mean, you know, we're talking fractions of a millisecond here, but Postgres is notably faster in both the four and the 200 field case. So our index lookups on a B-tree style index, because these are both B-tree indexes, is quite a bit faster. Yes? Uh, uh, which? For the insert, no. no the, the, there were no indexes at insert time on either one. Yeah. So it was not, it was, there was no index update overhead on I, in, in either Postgres or Mongo. The indexes were created afterwards. Um, so, um, yeah, because, you know, it would be kind of unfair to create indexes on one and not the other and then to try to time them out. Um, so, so we're still faster on a B-tree, on a B-tree query, but Mongo's not doing too badly, you know, have to say. Um, now we create a gin index on the whole on 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 the whole JSON document. So this is a gin. Um, this is with a gin index. This is with gin pattern ops, and this is with a Mongo field index. Gin index is a lot slower. Pattern ops is actually faster than a Mongo field index. And note that this is on a particular. This is a B tree on a particular field. This is a gin index on the entire document. We didn't have to specify in advance which field we're indexing. So we're actually doing pretty well there. Gin index, general, gin index that's not pattern ops, not so great. So 
this does, of course, mean some functionality limitations, like we can only use the containment operator. So, and on the 200, um, the, Mongo, the, the, um, um, the Mongo performance is about the same there. Um, JIN index is really slow compared to the pattern ops index. Um, now, lest we forget, here's what happens with, this is comparing it to relational data. Uh, yeah, so lest, lest we forget how much faster relational data is. Uh, that's, yeah, for people who can't see in the back, there's this tiny little blue bar here that's about four pixels hot wide um, compared to um, Mongo compared to Postgres. So Mongo 3 is much improved. It, they really did, it's not just hype. I don't know about the seven to 10 performance in, per, uh, increase they're quoting, but it is faster. Um, it performs really well for extracting a single field from a large JSON body. That it, um, the extraction operation has obviously been very much improved, which is where Mongo really fell down the last time, is where it had to pull a field out from the middle of a relatively large um, JSON. Indexing a single field com performs comparably. Postgres is faster, but, it, 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 but let's be fair, we're talking 0.2 milliseconds versus 0.3 milliseconds. We're not talking 0.2 milliseconds versus 10 milliseconds for how fast it is. It doesn't really have an equivalent of Postgres kill JIN. Now I know people who are familiar with Mongo raise their hand, but say, but the text, the, the, um, the, the full text search. The problem is that's not equivalent to JIN because it goes through a stemmer, it goes through, it's, it's much more equivalent to Postgres's full text search type indexes. So it's a very different animal from a JIN index. It's designed for full text searching. It's not really designed for this kind of like tags where the, where the um, data is, is, uh, is only interesting to computers. It's not natural language. So game on, now we know what we need to improve. Um, so Mongo does really well, and it does do better than Postgres, for documents with a large number of JSON fields that you are scanning sequentially. How, how many people build applications where that's their center, their, their performance bottleneck? Yeah, thought so. Um, in most other cases, though, JSONB does perform better, even against the Mongo, Mongo 3. Um, and relational performance, there's no comparison. You know, it's just, um, so if you, if you have a field, in a, if you have a relational column versus a JSON field, uh, Postgres is gonna run a gazillion times faster. A gazillion's a technical term. Um, so here we are in 2015. Um, we still have world-class JSON support. We are not faster than Mongo in every single way anymore. So let's, um, but we are still fast, really, really fast. And we are particularly fast if you do this, um, which is what you should be doing, which is that you don't uh, use Postgres as just a pure JSON store, but you use, you use JSON for what it's good at and, you, and use re the relational data for what it's good at. And if you do that, you'll end up with a really, really fast application. Um, by the way, if you haven't already, check out ToroDB, um, which is a server that runs on top of, um, Postgres that speaks the MongoDB wire protocol but fans out the JSON into relational columns and it just annihilates Mongo, any version. So it's not, it's not yet production, production release but it's really a very neat project, check it out. And that's my talk. <laughs> Questions? I think we have plenty of time. Yes. Um, less than there used to be. Um, so each store in the, in the good old days was the only, the only thing you got as far as this kind of key value store. The H stands for hash. Um, and it was a, a key value store. It's in contrib, it's still in contrib. Um, the downsides of it were it wasn't hierarchical, it couldn't handle arrays, it was only key value. Um, and it was a, a Postgres specific kind of thing. And it was in contrib, which meant you had to install it, which was kind of annoying. Um, as now, there's HStore2, which actually uses the same underlying binary format as, as JSONB, um, but um, has HStore style syntax for compatibility with previous versions of HStore. Um, HStore was, was the best way of handling this up until we had JSONB. Now I would suggest using JSONB because kind of everyone gets JSONB, and the performance is pretty much the same. It's, uh, at the, now, basically, HStore2 and JSONB use the same underlying data form, it's just their different syntaxes for writing the data structures. One thing with the H store that was a, like a comparative function, did you say these two things, what's the difference between them? 
can get, yeah, I don't know if you can do that with it. I think there is, but I'm not 100% sure. It's not as easy as just doing a minus, which is kind of a shame. There should be an intersect operation or, or a, like that, but easy to write because you could write it built based on the Roset creation stuff. That would be fun. Probably wouldn't perform that well, though. No, you have to, unfortunately now, you, currently you have to pull it apart and put it back together. And that is, that is a shame. Um, that, is, that is a limitation on JSONB. I, I, I don't know if it's going away in 9.5, but it should go away promptly, I would hope. Um, it's not hard to write, but we don't, I don't think it's in core currently. Can you talk about uh, React? Nope, not familiar with React. <laughs> <laughs> Um, it would be a roughly comparable, I, well, first I wouldn't do it that way, but you know, you know that, that would be kind of an oddball way of doing the schema. Um, it would probably be, it could potentially be faster because the JSON documents themselves will be smaller because you're effectively peeling out the first layer of JSON structure by making it relational. That being said, you're losing a huge optimization possibility there, which is to just make them relational columns right at the top. If I understood your question correctly, which I may not have. Well, really, but purely, I, I, my, okay, maybe I misunderstood. My, my, um, what I would do is, if you have, if you peel off the top level, and instead of saying A is a JSON, is a simple JSON type, I would say A is an int, and B is a, you know, that's what I mean by making the top level a pure relational column. Because um, you save a lot of storage, because it's not a variable length type, and all that kind of thing. So. Um, it'll be faster if you make each one a JSON field because, um, because again, you're effectively losing the top layer of, um, but you're also picking up some overhead because each one now needs a length field, uh, needs, needs to keep its length around since they're variable length. Well, It's um, this. You. It's not so much what, what you're. It's not so much paying for storage, but every byte you have to pick up and rattle is a performance hit, you know. And that. So, um, you're. It'll. It'll. It, all I can say is, sure, it'll be faster. But you know, use Postgres for what it's good at, which is the relational data. You know, it's really, really fast on the relational data. Other questions? Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. uh, are you aware of this? Well, I, um, I, I, uh, I, I wouldn't be surprised if there are surprises there. I, I would be surprised if it's impossible. Yeah, currently what you have to do is extract the array, do extract, and then array add it back into the array. Huh, well, is, is it because, um, okay. Um, you know, that's, that's, that's a shame, you know. <laughs> Again, that's, there, you know, there's some obvious functionality that, that that the Postgres could definitely grow in this regard. Um, it would be nice if we, I, I don't know if there's a reason for that or not, truth to be told, yeah, so. Okay, thank you very much.